Well, good afternoon, investors, and welcome back. We've been away for a few days. Uh, welcome back to our post-Thanksgiving edition of Bull Sessions. My name is Mark Robertson. I am joined here by my dear friend, Ken Kabula. Good afternoon, Ken. We're going to try to save your voice as best we can. Does this come from yelling incessantly at the at the TV while watching World Cup, or? No, another... although I have been watching World Cup, I'm surprised at at the fact that I I I am as interested in that as I am in almost any other sport on TV. So uh, I've been watching some of the World Cup games. I admit I don't understand very much about the strategy, and a lot of times it looks <laughs> like they're just playing with each other. But uh, you know. Well, it is, hey. it is quite an event, and we are up against the United States versus Iran, and uh, I believe our survival is at stake um, to go on to the next round if we have to win this game. So we'll have to hope for the best. All right, so we do date stamp this with uh, some World Cup references there. Um, the Twitter bird on the left, again, I just have been collecting pictures and interesting uh, memes and type, that type of stuff that have to do with Twitter these days. And that one just is the water cooler at the company headquarters. And it's basically a, a mess right now, apparently. Apparently you can go wander to the water cooler and end up in the unemployment line if you're not careful. So kind of an interesting situation. The other thing that's been going on the last couple of weeks, and again, we have taken a couple of weeks off to do some healing and, and uh, Ken and I have both been ill from time to time in the last couple of weeks and just trying to rest recover and enjoy thanksgiving and we did do that and uh it's good to be back one of the big things going on right now i don't know if you've been watching this stuff ken but china is erupting in a uh, a huge number of riots for china and uh the the big news was that the foxconn factory and in fact near wuhan had been shut down due to the rioting in the area. And uh, the riots have spread to Shanghai and Beijing and five or six other major cities that have been listed. And uh, it's, not a, it's not a small thing. Um, the point to be made is you do that in China um, and get identified by the government, your life is literally at risk. So well, Mark, the the newest news this morning is that China is going to loosen a lot of these zero COVID restrictions uh, and begin treating COVID like they treat the flu. Uh, now I don't know if there's double meaning to that. Maybe they treat the flu real, uh, you know, in a real harsh way as well. But uh, they are going to begin to lift some of the zero COVID uh, restrictions almost immediately. Uh, that's been the news uh, mm -hmm. for the last three or four hours uh, all over the the uh, media here. So perhaps we'll see some changes and perhaps there's double talk going on too. You just never know. Well, it, 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 it does suggest that there is an evolving situation in China. Um, I happen to know that they do treat the flu. Any area that's got a flu outbreak, you see a lot more masks than you would have traditionally in the United States, even pre-COVID. So they, they do have a almost a cultural uh, emphasis against that sort of thing. But we have talked in the past a little bit, and we're going to talk about it briefly here today, that there is a need for Apple to get a little bit more diversified on some of its sourcing. And Apple has already begun uh, putting new manufacturing uh, capacity in places like Vietnam, Singapore, Indonesia. And uh, that's something that probably needs to continue because they, and they're not alone here, a lot of our pharmaceutical manufacturing is uh, lives over in China and it, it really is not prudent, uh, prudent diversification. We'll just leave it at that for now, Ken. All right, let's go ahead and get underway. Again, here's just our boilerplate reminder that no investment recommendation is intended. This is about education. Please use it for education. We are illustrating and demonstrating some of the methodologies, techniques, and philosophies of the modern investment club movement as we have interpreted them at Manifest Investing and via the National Association of Investors and Better Investing. So you're going to hear opinions and of those interpretations. We're really just trying to take eight decades of lessons learned and share them. 
from the discovery of an idea to the analysis of an opportunity. Please do your own review and analysis of any company before making a decision. If we own something, we will try to remember to mention that. We do have an event this evening called The Roundtable. It's a monthly webcast. It's free. Uh, four or five of us generally come together and talk about a specific idea. Uh, I'll probably cover Apple tonight unless I change my mind between now and then. But uh, that particular demonstration is running at about a 15 the 16% annualized rate of return over the last 12 years. If you'd like to be added to a reminder about those monthly webcasts, please send an email expressing your interest to nkabula1 at comcast.net. And then if you have any other follow-ups, including if you'd like copies of these slides or have other topics or things that you want to discuss, our two email addresses are right there on the screen. Mark R at manifestinvesting.com, kkabula1 at comcast.net. All right. Good to go, Ken. Good to go, Mark. Here's our weekly slide, basically showing the, the market as represented by the value line arithmetic average. The green bars are an index built from the companies covered by the value line standard edition, their investment survey. And you can see it's zigged and zagged over the last several years. You're looking at approximately 25 years of data. The blue line is simply a mathematical regression through those points we believe that the green bars will ultimately follow the blue line and uh, it will soar above it and dip below it, but over the long term, basically following that kind of trajectory. The red dots are basically the combined forecast of all the companies that are in the standard edition from time to time. And you can see during some of those major moments in stock market history, like 2008, 2009, the return forecast on the average stock actually spiked up to extremely high levels. If you look to the far right, you can see that we're kind of in that 13% range, saying that most of the stock studies that you do are going to look pretty good. They're going to be in the hold zone, or uh, you're going to have a few more buys than than usual, and your returns are going to be in that 13 to 14% range on average. So the market is a little bit undervalued after this fairly steep drop over the last several months. Anything else you'd like to add to that, Ken? I just want to remind people again that that last green bar that you see is a work in progress, and we won't know where exactly it finishes until December 31st. So uh, when we first put that last bar onto the graph, that would have been October 1st, uh, there was a lot of white space between the top of that bar and the blue line. And that bar has grown very slowly up towards the blue line uh, throughout the months of October and November. So I'm kind of anxious to see if it actually hits that line during December. Maybe a Santa Claus rally. All right, checking in quickly, fairly quickly on our groundhog. We do a groundhog contest from groundhog day to groundhog day. So a million do do groundhog dollars are invested on February 2nd. And uh, this shows how the participants are doing. This is one of the strangest years ever. Uh, we have one entrant, and that happens to be a celebrity entrant, David Einhorn, above the original million dollars. So that's 165 that are not out of the 166. So that's that's kind of bizarre based on our experience. But uh, Herb Lemkul is our current individual leader with his Sin Soap and Soup entry this year. And uh, he's, he's camping around that million dollar mark and might get there by the end. And uh, other people of note, uh, there's a few recent former champions, including the, the Space Coast chapter and uh, Model Club. And uh, Anna Gombar, two-time winner, not in the last couple of years, but uh, the Graham, Graham Stephens monkey, that is purely a dartboard set of selections, is checking in at 14 still. He's being annoying. Cy Lynch, who will be with us tonight, is on the list, but a lot of stuff going on. Again, the average return is almost a negative 10%. That's relative to the market, so it's been a rough year. We are more accustomed to seeing 60 to 80% beating the market, which is the exact opposite of that number right there. 
Kathy Wood remains in last place, 166th. And I would like to point out, it is my birthday, by the way, that I have gained, moved up the list 60 places. And uh, you can look really hard for my name. You're, st you're st still not going to see it. I continue to be down closer to our one, 100, even after moving up the list that far. So I'll take another 60. Anything you'd like to point out, Ken? Or should we roll? Let's roll, Mark. All right. We're saving ourselves for tonight also, everybody. We have a, a round table tonight. All right. Here's a question. I can't even remember who sent it to me, but I had written it down and saved it. So from the mailbag, just finished reading one of the Bullis Library books that we talked about. We'll show that to you in a second. But The Common Sense on Mutual Funds is one of the first books I read as an investor back in the 1990s. In fact, there was a predecessor book to this one. And uh, uh, Jack Bogle believed quite strongly in an asset allocation, I would call it almost a device, of 60% stocks, 40% bonds for the average investor. And uh, it's something that is used by a number of financial planners. Most of the people here listening would probably push that number to 80 or 90 or a, I happen to be a 100-0 type person. But... Uh, the question here is being asked, you know, he talks about a lot in the book. It's an area that I probably disagree with him a little bit, but it would come in 28th place. Uh, I was a little bit surprised by that because of all the um, highly technical term whining going on from the bond market. And you can see the two components actually add up to almost $900,000 and actually beating the Wilshire 5,000 by almost a percentage point. So, you know, it, it is meant to be a protective measure and even with the bond market having one of the worst years in history uh it still has been somewhat protective uh any you know that um, original million dollars invested is down to 878 but in just stocks it would be down another hundred thousand any thoughts ken well uh i think there's a lot of that's been written on this 60-40 idea. Uh, I think if you were just to kind of Google the, the the general idea, you get all kinds of articles and all kinds of opinions. Uh, I'm of the opinion that maybe it's a little outdated and that if anything, uh, the percentages need to be adjusted for longer lifespans. Uh, I, I really think that this one kind of focused on, on the age of, of uh, 65 uh, being kind of a, 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 a of a place where the average person was thinking about uh, calling it quits. So uh, I I think maybe it's a little bit dated. I, I uh, I've read a lot on it. I, I don't tend to agree with it. Uh, I tend to think that that there's a, a better allocation. I think there is a place for bonds in most portfolios, but uh, I'm not sure that it's 40 percent of the whole portfolio. Yeah, and I would just echo that in one last editorial comment. I do think that the influence of this theory slash concept um, has boiled over into the target date funds, and it, it really shows up there in, in what I would basically feel is a overly conservative. Again, we're, we're basically talking about a situation where some individuals do need to be protected from volatility. They just can't take the... The volatility of 100% investing in stocks. That's not true for most of the people here uh, during this session. So it's just it's a personal thing, and uh, that 60/40 needs to be thought through and personalized. All right, here's a quick look at that library mentioned by the per by the person who submitted the question. Number of great books on here, especially holiday time of the year. Might think about some of them. The three Peter Lunch books on the left are some of my personal favorites. Um, I've read this one up here at least three or four times. It's available online. You can actually get a PDF version of it online. Um, Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham and reworked by Jason Zweig. Um, just, just an awful lot of good books. Investing for a Successful Future was the first book ever featured in Better Investing Magazine back in 1960. Um, this book here, if you're curious about the stuff we've done with projected return on value, lovingly referred to as Prove, 
Um, a lot of it came from right here. Joel Greenblatt, strong influence. Do you have a favorite book here, Ken? Well, I... Or two, uh, or three? It's, it's not a very... Uh, yeah, I am unmuted. Okay, you're... It's not a very uh, scintillating read, but I really uh, got a lot out of the joys of compounding when I uh, first read that, uh, and and that has to be an older read. I'm I'm guessing 10, 12, 15 years. I'm not sure, uh, but my most recent read, The Psychology of Money, was one of the most enjoyable reads I've had in the investing world in a long, long time. Got a lot out of the joys of compounding, but. Uh, well, you had to really stick to it to read it. <laughs> I really enjoyed Snowball. By the way, if you're a Value Line fan and you like to dig into the history and informative stuff behind Value Line, that evaluation of common stocks on the far right is literally the written by the inventor and and uh, caretaker at Value Line over the years. And the other one, and it actually dovetails with what we were just talking about with that 60-40 thing. The book by Clunan, Investing at Level 3, you got to wrestle with it a little bit, but it's full of a whole bunch of stuff. And, oh, by the way, he he and George Nicholson agreed whether they knew it or not. And uh, it's good stuff. And last but not least, well, two last but not least, this book on factful, factfulness will challenge you and your perceptions about the world, uh, most of us anyhow. And uh, we have talked about this one extensively this year, The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. He's a great writer. You, you left our Google book off the the graphic here, Mark. Yeah, I thought about adding it to it. I think I, I still might. Next time I display this, I might yeah. put life after Google. And that's uh, yeah. maybe after I try to tackle it and read it one more time because it's very timely right now with what Facebook is going through. And we've talked about here in previous sessions uh, the challenges facing Facebook, Google. now, And now you can throw Apple in there too. All right. Just a quick update on the best small companies. I'm doing this. We're not going to do it every week, but the fact that we're ahead is refreshing and something to be thankful for. So the rabbit grabbed a Thanksgiving hat. It looks conspicuously like Ken's sorter hat. Hey, Mark, uh, be, 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 uh, could I just interrupt and, and get two books on the record for us to maybe take a look at going into the future? Sure. Uh, one of them is Big Money Think Small. Okay. Big Money Thinks Small by Joel Tillinghast and Thinking in Bets by Annie Duke. Uh, these are two uh, of Matt Spielman's uh, favorite uh, texts. And I know we've been looking for a couple of newer books to, to bring out and talk about. So uh, either one of those deserves at least a look. Okay. We'll take a look at that and see if it's something we might have a little, uh, little discussion round on. All right, so again, we're, we are ahead, and this continues to illustrate the, the challenge of swimming upstream. The Russell 2000 Growth Exchange Traded Fund is actually behind where it started back on Halloween just a month ago. So we will uh, just simply wink and hope for a continuation of this one-month trend. Here are the companies that have done that. And we actually have only one misbehaving coming home with the bad grade on the report card. Any good parent knows that you, you focus on the Fs and not the A's. No, actually, that's, it should be the other way around. We should focus on what's working and try to do more of that. So the ones up at the top are working fairly well so far. Uh, Gentherm has been has far exceeded my expectations already. And there are some great companies. I am not... Ken, are you concerned about the banks uh, being sluggish or not? I'm not concerned about the banks being sluggish, Mark. I, I really think that, <laughs> I think that so. as we, we move, I'm just not concerned. Uh, I think that that uh, a bank is a, a kind of business model that is needed by business in order to continue to grow. And I think once things settle down with, with the Fed and with inflation and everything, uh, we're, we're certainly been in kind of a, a strange year with the Fed moving the interest rates as far and as fast as they've done it. Uh, and that has to be uh, slowing down now as we move into 2023. So uh, I'm 
I'm really pleased with this list. Uh, I chose to actually put real money into three of them, and uh, so far my picks are all making money. So I'm feeling I'm feeling excellent about the whole thing. So happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Now, right. Now Portillo's did take a bit of a break, and so they they dropped down. They were at the top of the list a few weeks ago, and now they're. I notice um, I don't see the food picture this this particular uh, yeah, month. Yeah, so. I don't I don't don't know whether that'll appear tonight or not. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Okay. Stay uh, tuned. All right. all right, so let's go ahead and dig into what we wanted to talk about for today. We do have a bull session, or excuse me, a roundtable tonight. So a lot of our focus on these monthly Tuesday afternoons is what might we be talking about tonight. So straight from the homepage, we're going to drill into expected returns for this week. I did want to point out that you can click on these. These are live links and be taken to the equity analysis for any of those companies and usually by the over the next couple of days they will be available for any company that is high on your radar screen either as a, a manifest 40 widely followed company or a company that has been selected at a round table as is shown here these are active round table positions and these are active links to get to them uh, lockheed martin has gone up huge since kim selected it a few months ago probably related to what's going on over in Europe. But for today, the screening result tab from the, this week will take us to um, some roundtable hunting. So let's go ahead and do that. There are some, uh, some, some of them are just entertaining. Some are educational. Uh, reading references down at the bottom, you can see Morgan Housel, we just mentioned his book. He's a good writer and writes a, a blog and a weekly column also. Okay, drilling down into the, the screening stuff, here are some of the companies that have actually been unearthed and were, were considered, at least by me, for tonight, and Ken actually going to sneak one in there too. Five companies that showed up through some of our favorite uh, screening type techniques or methods. Uh, Catalent, Google, Align Technology, Malibu Boats, one of our best small companies, and Western Alliance. That was our best small company from two years ago. And uh, the honorable mention goes to the companies that are shown there, including MP Materials, one of our best small companies for this year. And then we're gonna spend a few minutes talking about Apple and this notion of bad things happening to potentially good companies. So the first screen is shown down there at the bottom, simply looking for companies that have decent um, overall perspective, maybe early stage, that type of stuff but with a relative strength index less than 30. And that qualifies as being oversold. That's what the talking heads are talking about when they're on CNBC, when they talk about something being oversold or overbought. In this case, oversold is a relative strength index, RSI, less than 30. So these are three that showed up here. Um, I think all three are worthy studies. I do not know the scope of supply for motor car parts of America. I suspect it's a competitor to Advanced Auto, but uh, I'd be a little bit concerned about the quality ranking. I'd want to understand, you know, what, what are they perhaps a little deficient in, but they do have the lowest relative strength rating. With the market being kind of, uh, it's had a fair amount of upside in the last month, although it's kind of subsided here in the last few days, these numbers are going to be a little bit more elevated when it comes to the relative strength index. More on that in a second. Tech Target, company I'm not familiar with other than just a, a glancing look at what they do. They are an IT, uh, almost a, a brokerage, or a, uh, some have described some of the things that they do as a consumer reports of IT type stuff, um, you know, ratings and rankings and that kind of thing. And they also do, again, broker some uh, equipment type things. So it's, it's a decent study. And Catalent, a company that I'm not familiar with. By the way, the two asterisks mean that the company is not in the Value Line Standard Edition. Catalent is. It's an issue one of the Value Line Standard Edition, so you get a, a full company report. They basically are in the drug delivery business, uh, from the capsules that your medications are inserted into to take to things like um, solvents and... and uh, uh, salves and that type of stuff for actually taking medications 
and that would be the one that would jump off the page at me, decent quality, uh, at least good, and uh, pretty good across the board. So that's why I threw it up there on the list to take a closer look at. I'd also indicate, Mark, that that proof number that's going with Tech Target mm -hmm. uh, is telling me to be really careful uh, when I'm doing my analysis. Uh, that par number of 25% versus a prove of 12 and a half, that's, that kind of variance uh, by 50% doesn't happen that often. Yeah, and the number one culprit quite often is going to be the PE, the projected PE ratio that you may want to condition to yeah. something slightly less. So yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a nice way of sa saying use a lower PE, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're being a little more direct about it. Okay. All right, so why do we obsess on this? And this is one of my favorite slides of all time. Back in the days, remember March 2020? Think back, remember that you were told you had to stay home and everybody on the news told you the world was coming to an end and, and uh, COVID was uh, still quite the mystery. I mean, it still is mysterious, but it was really a mystery back then. Well, back in that time frame, looking at the relative strength index, now these are current numbers. These are all current. These are today numbers. Back at that moment in time here, shown by the, you know, March 2020, we were finding relative strength indices down around 10. And we get really interested when a, a company that is attractive to us, you know, the story's good, the, the up straight and parallel situation is intact, and it, it's down below 20. But these were actually closer to like 10. And... Uh, this group of companies, in fact, this, this, the short version of the story is, this is, I'm not making this up. I was looking for a stock to recommend to my son-in-law. And uh, Chef, he's a culinary guy. Um, Chef's Warehouse actually showed up. I literally, and I am not exaggerating, I've told the story here before, I walk up the stairs, make a hot dog, come back downstairs, and it had gone up 100% um, over lunch. And... Uh, but it was on, it's on the list from that day. You can see that it's proceeded to do uh, 100%. These are annualized numbers, by the way. These are all annualized. And uh, notice how these have done versus the market right next. I mean, some of these I would uh, hold my nose, but there's also some companies there that uh, are quite fascinating. Now, Boot Barn, Kevin is going to talk about tonight. Even though that's had one heck of a run, it's still well-positioned for looking forward. When you take a look at these projected returns and this quality, that's the story you're going to hear from Kevin Gologli tonight if you attend the roundtable. Anything on here of great interest you can? Well, I am just guess I'm kind of happy I don't own any of them, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> Is there too much adventure here? Too much adventure, right, uh-huh. The one that I do draw everybody's attention to is Wolverine Worldwide. I bought this company at this price or very close to this price. I sold it within six months for $30. It's now back down to 10. And this is the Hush Puppy Company. It's uh, it's probably a worthy study. Again, I wouldn't necessarily marry it or fall in love with it, but every once in a while it just can make sense to, to pursue those types of opportunities. But again, Moral of the story, this is why a low relative strength index, uh, under 30, hopefully under 20 even, can be uh, worthy of paying some attention to. All right, the next screen that we took a quick look at, uh, at Manifest, you can screen based on triple play. I think I probably added, well, no, the sweet spot is, uh, we've got some companies above the sweet spot, so I just went for high quality companies that uh, are triple play candidates pretty awesome list. It's a company that we have talked about. We've talked about all those companies in fairly significant detail with the exception of ZTO Express, which I believe would be a competitor to FedEx. And Advanced Drainage. Ken, did you get a chance to look at Advanced Drainage at all? I I did a, a shallow dive mark into Advanced Drainage thinking it might be a, a good stock to consider for the round table. And uh, I got about uh, eight minutes into it, maybe even less than that, and decided I didn't really want to do very much more about advanced drainage. Uh, it's a pretty easy company to understand. They sell drainage uh, 
products, uh, things that you would buy in, in industrial applications or residential applications or whatever. Uh, but uh, there were just too many things not to like about the company uh, without going into a full-blown stock study. I would indicate that if you think it might be interesting, take a look at its SSG. I, I don't think it'll take you too long to, to show you why uh, I moved to something else. Yeah, that EPS stability has to be one thing that would be uh, potentially annoying to you. But maybe, you know, Ken, maybe this is an omen because I know you and Ann Manning were talking about drainage in the green room before we got started in the session today. So we were. So maybe it is an omen, but I'm staying away from the stock <laughs> and you can buy it if you want to. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We did feature Taiwan Semi two weeks ago and it's it's currently the feature stock. Malibu Boats is pretty high on radar screens right now. Still looking interesting. All right. Next topic, Hugh McManus's favorite. That's why we call it the Irish Spring. He has a collection of companies that are basically vetted, and he waits for them to be trading close to their 52-week low, uh, less than 20% from their 52-week low, hopefully in single digits is how he generally describes it. And, you know, he's got companies on that list like Abbott Labs and uh, a variety of companies, Eli Lilly. And they're not all healthcare companies, but they're all kind of like that. And uh, Microsoft, um, he basically gets interested any time a company gets there. So we do have the capability to go hunting for those. And you can see the criteria on the right, again, in the sweet spot. So 16 to 20% type returns. Um, vetted generally is going to be demanding higher quality. And again, within 20% of the 52-week low. You do get a few different companies here. I do like Ann Manning's Align Technology. She presented that in Dallas at the National Convention. And uh, Walker & Dunlop is one of our best small companies for this year. And I would also note that uh, if your portfolio doesn't or hasn't considered Google, it might be time for that. Your thoughts, sir? I uh, if, if I'm going to look at a a very easy to understand business model. Uh, instead of doing the, the drainage company, I might look at Trex. Uh, and I'm especially uh, high on the, the company pool right now. Uh, this used to be a company that just sold pool chemicals. And I think it deserves a, an extra study uh, because 60% of its business now comes from contracted services in maintenance of pools and associated uh, things that you you either uh, wade in or float in or swim in or whatever. Uh, very interesting stock study, both of those, Trex and Pool. Oh, and I know. really attractive RSIs. Yeah, I do think that uh, Pool has diversified into some other things. And if they had picked up Pickleball, I would have been all over them. But... <laughs> All right, so that's another one where we pick up some ideas. Align Technology, again, the brace company, good stuff. Here's one of my favorite screens. We're basically looking at companies that have uh, top shelf quality and top shelf uh, return forecast in the form of a projected annual return. So the, it's referred to as ivory soap because I search for a manifest rank. It's a combined index of those two criteria above 99.4. So these two are going to look pretty good for, on all of these companies. I am still uh, insisting on at least a financial strength. That's an 80. And in this case, I've said I, I only want to look at core candidates, companies that basically have decent quality, decent uh, earnings per share stability, I should say, good or excellent uh, financial strength. Those three categories are basically the the core score. Okay. And... Uh, Again, a lot of uh, names are repeating here. That's okay when you're doing screening. Sometimes that can be the nudge to push us towards studying a, a company that has higher potential. And uh, that's a pretty good list to study. And again, without beating the drum too much, uh, Google is ending up on this list very highly ranked. And uh, it is an important component of the 10 cup demonstration portfolio. And I do think it's been in, the, well, I know it has been in the round table multiple times, selected multiple times. And of course, 
uh, Ken's selection for this evening. You want to hear uh, an update on Western Alliance because that is a repeat selection for the roundtable tracking portfolio. All right. Anything else on here, Ken? Well, I'm. Uh... I, I'm, I like the repetition coming out in some of these companies, Mark, and uh, I think you've pointed out some of the more interesting uh, companies. Um, I, I'm surprised that uh, the, that Signature Bank uh, ranks as high as it does. Uh, uh, I, I think Signature Bank has is a very well managed bank, a very a very high quality bank. Uh, I'm just not certain it's as as high as I can find elsewhere. That's all. Yeah, I would agree with that. All right. So there's some uh, companies to kick around there. And speaking of banks, I had to put in a return on assets. Uh, this is the taking the regional bank industry group and basically ranking it by return on assets. Now, that's a single year or a trailing 12-month number. But, uh, again, this is screening, so we're basically just looking for targets for a deeper dive and uh what what do you love here ken well i i love the fact that the whole list is uh, above up one and a half one and a half uh signifies that you have a a, a superb return on average well this is roa it's not exactly the same number as roaa which is return on average assets. probably trailing That's 12 months yeah yeah it's close enough yeah and uh, the only thing that I would say is that as you go to study banks, uh, uh, take this data now and then look at, at ROA or ROAA for the last four or five years. If that number can be at one five or better for a period of time, three, four, five, six years, then you really have found yourself a great candidate. Uh, it's it's not easy for a bank to pop into this list even uh, for one year, uh, but you're looking for banks that can do it for three or four or more years in a row. And when you find banks like that, that's where some of your money should go. Yeah, and like we said, Ken is going to talk about Western Alliance tonight. I think it probably jumps off the page right here. Uh, decent return, uh, excellent quality. And I, th I think... Uh, if you actually dug in and took a closer look, these higher financial strength ratings are probably the companies Ken was just talking about. And notice how these these are companies that he he has talked about before. So these are more likely to have uh, a longer um, demonstrated trend in place. Well, and, think and I own two of the three you circled, Mark. So yeah. yeah. So those are those are probably companies that have demonstrated. Um, exceptional consistency and this one of course is also pretty special and this is uh, another one of ken's personal favorites all right that's a good shopping list i i really would uh encourage anybody new to stud studying regional banks that that's not a bad one too to take a look at but look for the things we've been talking about uh consistent demonstrated ex uh, exceptional performance and just kind of watch for that and these can really be uh, a good piece of a portfolio, taking care of it. It's been an extremely important piece of our best small companies for the last uh, several years. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this one. This one actually is also borrowed, uh, a topic borrowed from a combination of Hugh McManus and Cy Lynch. And uh, Hugh often talks about finding a company that's just getting pummeled you know, and bad opinion pieces and that kind of stuff. And he believes that those are opportunities to accumulate. I think we may have that situation with Apple right now. It has not been uh, pummeled as much as some of the other technology stocks, but uh, the diversification uh, supply side stuff in China is real, something that they have to address, and it's not going to be inexpensive. They will be doing that. And, uh, you know, there, there's a fair amount of political risk associated with China. So there are things that could happen. And, uh, again, we want to focus on this theme of, you know, a company that's actually fairly good but can have uh, nasty stuff happen to it from time to time. And, no, Ken, I don't know if there's any relationship between the author of this book and 
uh, Mr. Kushner, who used to work at the White House. I will look that up, though. I hadn't made that connection. Here's the other thing about Apple that's going on right now. I don't know how serious this is yet, but Apple basically threatened to remove Twitter from the Apple store. Um, Elon Musk's response to that was, I recommend you don't do that. And his tweet was, he declares a Twitter war. Um, I I don't see where picking a fight with uh, Elon Musk and Twitter would be a good thing for Apple. I, I really don't. I mean, he's eccentric. Um, there's a lot of things you can say, but uh, it, it would seem to be a, a potentially dangerous thing to do. And as I've pointed out in the past, it's an overly simplistic way of looking at things. But this gentleman lands rockets on barges. Um, not somebody to pick a fight with, in, in my opinion. Any thoughts on that, Ken? I uh, tend to agree, but for a slightly different reason. Uh, I tend to agree to think that this gentleman is also a uh, a touchstone for uh, anybody that wants to scream and yell about almost anything, and that getting your company involved with with where he's uh, at isn't necessarily good for business. I just don't think it is. Yeah, and um, specifically what I'm referring to is that he basically said he he will create his own version of an iPhone. You know, and, and an iPhone doesn't need that kind of competition. I mean, could be very interesting. So here's what I want uh, to take the, a look at. Even the smartest man in the world, Mark, only has 24 hours in a day to do things. <laughs> That's true, but he's got some smart people who work for him. I Again, I don't know where this can end up. I just know that it would be a reason to question uh, the judgment uh, of an Apple organization. They're already on probation with me because they built that humongous office, but uh, who knows? Anyhow, I, I do consider it to be a clear and present danger and the position in China is part of that. And again, as I mentioned, Hugh likes to find these companies that are basically having a moment, a challenging moment, and it can be an opportunity to accumulate shares over time. Um, I think we have that potential situation with Apple. Um, if they do basically make it through whatever challenges lie ahead, uh, it's a pretty solid situation over time. Um, and Cy Lynch is always encouraging us to think about a challenge like this. Is it temporary or is it terminal? Um, big difference between the two. The first company on the upper right, they basically had a terminal moment. Um, this was the dominant cell phone manufacturer in the 1990s. And uh, uh, everybody that I knew had a Nokia phone back back in that time frame. Remember the, the old flip phones? Um, Ken, you may have had yours until recently, huh? Yeah, until uh, two weeks ago, Mark, they got me into <laughs> one, so... Just kidding. Just kidding. But, you know, Nokia definitely was spitting up blood um, after the iPhone came out. And they basically failed to meet that challenge. And uh, interestingly enough, they were purchased by Microsoft. I'm not sure the nature of that acquisition, but um, the current thinking is that Nokia may be on the way back. This is still a $25 billion company out of Finland. And uh, the rumors that I'm reading and something that you, you might want to be aware of, even as a understanding potential threats to Apple, is these guys appear to be uh, coming along fairly well in their development efforts here over the last year or so. And uh, some people are actually picking it up as a, a real value play with some potential. So something to think about. Now, when it comes to Wells Fargo, we'll talk about it in detail, but back in the early 1990s, we had one of those banking moments where uh, a bunch of banks misbehaved in the late 1980s. They ended up with a bunch of California banks that had some questionable assets on their books, and uh, they managed to fight their way through that, although I will argue, and you'll see a slide later on, where they have been slipping. Warren Buffett has, to my knowledge, sold all of his shares of Wells Fargo at this point. So they actually may be on that uh, 
very challenging part of the curve. And then Coca-Cola, another one of our favorite stories, um, the combination of Real Coke and uh, Columbia Picture Studios is part of that story. Anything you'd like to add, Ken, or is there any other company that comes to mind as somebody who has either failed or s survived a major challenge? Well, the, the only one that, that comes to mind, Mark, immediately is Dell Computer. Uh, and Dell Computer has been uh, in and out of uh, private hands. It's, it's uh, been a darling and then it's been a pariah. Uh, it's been everything to everybody. And uh, I'm not sure if it's the same category as you're talking about here, uh, but it certainly was a, a leader uh, at one point in its industry. Uh, I can remember, you know, that, that if you were going to buy a PC uh, at, at one point, then Dell was the brand to look for and to, to put on your desktop. Uh, but that's the only one that comes immediately to mind, Mark. Well, sorry to hear that because back in 1994, Investment Club had Dell Computer, and we had an, at that point, we were brand new beginners. We had an automatic sell at a 30% gain. And we sold it for a 30% gain. And then we left it on the club spreadsheet and in the broker, you know, the, the blank line in the brokerage statement. And uh, we watched it go up like another 400% shortly thereafter. So I don't oh, know. There were certainly times when Dell was certainly a great investment, uh, but we're looking at companies, all of them at one point were great investments and, and uh, what's happened to them since. Uh, my we we owned Wells Fargo uh, uh, because we originally held a, a South Carolina bank, which was bought by Northern Trust out of Minneapolis, which became part of Wells Fargo. So we held Wells Fargo in in uh, one of the IRAs for quite a while until uh, both of us looked at each other and said, "What the hell are we holding this thing for?" <laughs> and uh, moved on to something much more rewarding. All right, so here's that Coca-Cola Wac story. Just Wacovia. One... I'll even give you the name of the South Carolina bank. It was Wacovia. I remember uh, Wacovia. A long time ago. long time ago. That's part of the long-term story with the, all the banks, for that matter. All right, here's a look at Coca-Cola. Back in 1985, they had uh, this uh, questionable brainstorm of fixing something that wasn't broke. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. They came out with new Coke, which was basically Coke that tasted very, very similar to Pepsi, and it got weird. And uh, the company traded sideways. You can see the sideways trade after they brought it out. Um, there were a lot of people wondering what in the world's going on here. A little bit of a breakout. By the way, this was on a, after a conference call where they said, we're thinking about maybe not doing this. You can see what happened to the stock price. So it was just one of those things where, this really was a nasty moment. This was the back in the days of the original Pepsi challenge. And uh, Pepsi was beginning to to annoy Coca-Cola back in that time frame. And it was a moment for sure. Any thoughts here, sir? Uh, no, keep on uh, um, caffeinating us here. Okay, so, here we go. Yeah, so Coca-Cola then, they back in 1982, they had bought. Uh, Columbia Pictures, and uh, they finally, after a decade, and you know, we can go back and look at how tough it was for General Electric when they owned NBC and a number of media properties, including Comcast. I mean, this is just probably not the best form of diversification. I believe Peter Lynch referred to it as diversification uh, played out, um, but they came back at the end of the 1980s and actually had to do a fairly significant write-off. So they were they were definitely fumbling quite a bit back in, in that time frame. And people were actually concerned about the longer-term viability of, of this company, which was still the leading brand in the world. Here's a long-term look at it. Again, Warren Buffett did the majority of his investing into Coca-Cola back in that time frame when they divested uh, the motion picture studio. And uh, you can see that uh, the time frame after that divestiture was actually, uh, this is pretty massive when you think about it, because it, it traded basically sideways for a long time after that. And uh, 
Of course, George Nicholson featured Coca-Cola back in 1974, so he was 15 years ahead. But still a pretty solid situation over time. Again, the notion here is a company that faces a challenge, survives it, and continues to thrive. And uh, 11%, not the most uh, sexy return over the long term, but not bad for a portfolio. $1,000 invested back at the time that they let Columbia go free would now be worth nearly $33,000. So there's a moral in that story of, you know, if the company's going to survive the challenge and can, can continue to be an excellent company coming out of it, can be quite the opportunity. All right, anything else on Cope, Ken? Nope, nope, nope. All right, here's that Wells Fargo story. Again, this is on the heels of a number of banking and savings and loans fiascos in the late 1980s. And, uh, you know, maybe one of the points to be made here is there's a really nasty moment there inside that red box, but you, again, you can barely see it um, when you start talking about multiple decades. So here's a closer look at that time frame. And it, it was a nasty drop. You can see these are all sp split adjusted prices. So, so you can see that the company did lose approximately 40% of its value uh, between early summer and uh, early autumn back in 1990. This was the point in time when Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway began getting extremely interested in this company as probably facing temporary challenges. You know, back in this time frame that you're seeing right here, get, just getting hammered with respect to the stock price. But, uh, you know, again, the folks in Omaha were basically scratching their heads saying, you know, this could be a very good thing if they can just get back in the in the right type of operating mode. And they did. And here's actually the article from that same time frame pointing out how interested and I got a kick out of this here, Ken. Look at how they're referring to Mr. Buffett back in 1991. <laughs> With a reputation for savvy investments. Okay. It's pretty early in the track in the run for uh, Berkshire Hathaway. But the real kicker here is he ended up buying 22% of Wells Fargo, even back at that in that time frame. That's a huge stake in an enterprise like Wells Fargo. And basically getting it for pennies on the dollar when people were running screaming to the exits. And here is a look at uh, basically a stock selection guide. This data was pulled right out of an old Standard & Poor's book that I have at my desk from 1992 or 1993. So that's what the data is from. Don't worry so much about the scale. And uh, this is... At the top of the chart is book value. And you can see the challenges that happened in 1987 with the, the Great Recession back then and the, the huge hike in interest rates that went on and the portfolio insurance stuff that happened back in this time frame. Nasty moment for the financial services industry. And then again, following the, the banking troubles in that time frame. The big point on here, obviously, is earnings dropping way down here. And uh, I think Buffett's thesis at the time, it's the same type of thesis we talked about in our Crossing the Chasm educational series, is if you can assume that a company will continue to exist and perhaps thrive on the other side of this type of a challenge, you know, what, what does this potentially look like out here? And under those conditions, what would it be worth? It's the same type of mentality that Hugh used for his, I want to buy a bank. You know, back during the throes of the 2008-2009 crisis, his bank of choice was Bank of America. And very similar picture. History does repeat. It often rhymes anyhow. So another 10 or 15 years later, you could have just slapped Bank of America on here. You would have this same situation. And Hughes' assumption was, well, first of all, the government's not going to let these guys fail. And that being the case, it's going to look something like this on the right-hand side at some point in time. Might require some patience and understanding, but that's where it's probably going to end up. And uh, that, that was his entire thesis for the Bank of America. Same thing happening here, 
for Buffett and Wells Fargo. So, again, uh, facing a challenge, managing out of it, and doing well down the road can be an attractive investment opportunity. Any thoughts on this, Ken? Uh, no, except that uh, I've come to a personal conclusion, Mark, that uh, I'm not especially interested in any of these big banks, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, uh, you know, any of these uh, big money center banks that they just seem to to uh, have problem after problem and, and uh, hidden business model after hidden business model. I, I, I just think that if you really want to buy a bank, like you talked about uh, 20 years ago, that it's time to look at, at strong regional banks rather than money center banks. Yeah, and I think a lot of that centers on the trading desk, and uh, especially with the banks you mentioned, the J.P. Morgan. I know Wells has some of that, perhaps not quite as much. But Bank of America having the the Merrill Lynch connection, and it's going to introduce some additional volatility that the regional banks don't necessarily have. You know, headaches that you don't have to avoid, I guess, would be the way to look at it. I thought this was telling. Again, this underscores what Ken was talking about earlier, about uh, it's not just one year, it's the trend. So I, I, I thought you might enjoy this graphic, Ken. Yeah, and, and when you, you see those numbers up around one one two five one three one four one five, you know, uh you're you're dealing with a good bank. This this bank uh had a lot going for it up until uh the financial crisis of two thousand eight. And I don't think it's ever really recovered uh any of its mojo and and if anything, uh aren't those numbers, you know, I'm I'm not plotting it or anything, but aren't those numbers kind of trending downward since 2008, those return on asset numbers? Yeah, I mean, if you close your left eye and you just simply look at it, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing uh, two stories here. Yeah. And there's and been, that, I don't think we're imagining what's, things here. And what's interesting to me is that that 0.84 number uh, we've been given by our, our friends that, that no banks uh, they've told us that a good solid average return on asset number is 0.85. So Wells Fargo has gone from something stellar to uh, a good solid average bank. Well, there's a long list of good solid average banks ranging from those the size of Wells Fargo to those the size of Isabella Bank uh, and Trust, which I own, which is a, a little tiny local bank in, uh, in the county where uh, one of our major colleges is located. So uh, you, you can find good quality uh, in any size bank, and I'm not sure that you should be settling for something that's average. Yeah, so this is kind of the answer to the question. If you go back and look, people have been pressing Buffett for what's wrong with this company. They had a number of scandals. They're cross-selling stuff that went on. There's been a number of things go wrong, but uh, this is, uh, he threw in the towel sometime within the last couple of years, and I think it has to do with basically what that arrow looks like, what it comes down to. Interesting. All right, another company that went through some stuff. I'm just going to go through it and mention it very quickly. I think this is the case that we can make for Apple. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised to see Apple approach one, two, three, maybe even five-year lows here in the next uh, few months. But it could represent quite the opportunity for accumulation. By the way, that Lisa computer went for twenty-four or twenty-five thousand current day dollars. Um, just bringing it up to uh, current speed. So they had that moment. And five megabyte drive to go with it, Mark. So, I saw that. You know. A whopper. Yeah, considering this presentation is over 20, um, four of their hard drives. So, again, longer term look at Apple. You can see when the iPhone hits on here, uh, basically bringing Nokia to its knees, along with others. I mean, other companies tried to replicate that. It hasn't been all roses for Apple over the years, but if you had hung on to it, that's a massive number at the bottom of the page. And again, you if you find a company that can persist and thrive facing these type of challenges, and uh, as I have pointed out, I, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised to see Apple actually decline in price over the next several months. I would regard that as a potential accumulation opportunity. So we'll probably talk about more of it tonight. Um, 
nutshell, very high quality company. The return, although it's not glamorous at uh, 11 or 12% right now for the return forecast, it is relatively high over the last, compared to the last three or four years. So it is trading at a little bit elevated. Um, Long-term trend for sales is very consistent. Profitability is steady as a rock. Um, Morningstar disagrees. They do not think it's on sale, but I do find it intriguing that uh, the rhinos who follow the company think it is. So there is a difference of opinion for you. But uh, again, even if it is a 10 or 12% return for a company of this quality, um, and it's probably also a sign that it could actually relax in price a little bit, we'll uh, be watching it closely. Here's a reminder that we do YouTube uh, archive all of these on YouTube, the round tables, the bull sessions, and other special sessions that we've done. You can see that our best small companies is here from three weeks ago, Halloween, in the rearview mirror. Please consider subscribing. We'll let you know when we post new content. And we'll close today with uh, a slice of paradise, courtesy of Matt Spielman, I think is with us still. Um, he spent a few days while we were uh, facing sleet and snow. Matt was actually doing this in Hawaii. So I, I do have to admit, Ken, that we can be a little bit envious here. <laughs> I tried. I tried to offer it a you know, still away in a bag. He was. He, he would have none of it. All right. Any other? Well, questions I will say now that Mark minus the minus the palm trees, we do have views like this in Michigan, but only for about one month a year, not twelve <laughs> months a year. That's so. true. that's very true. Very yep. true. All right. So we do have a round table tonight. So we'll probably just go ahead and shut down. Save Ken's voice for this evening. And uh, see those of you there that choose to join us this evening. I've kept up on the question list, Mark, and we've uh, we've pretty well uh, I've pretty well answered uh, the questions that we had on the thing, or or we had them actually come on. So uh, you have an invitation from Mr. Lemkul to come on down anytime you want to to his place in Florida, Mark. Okay, and so that that's not. That's not out of the realm of viability, Ken. <laughs> All right. So see you in a little bit. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Good night, everybody, and see you tonight.